So, well, today uh, we're in part three of our mess series called Hashtag Follow. Everybody say, Hashtag Follow, okay? And uh, it's, it, today it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, part 3, 1 Samuel 15, 13 to 25. And today uh, I want to share something that um, I think is, you think, okay, hashtag about social media and all that, but it deals with society and it deals with all of us and our hearts and our longings and how we are really affected by our culture and society and what we're really following. And today it's about the fact that if you go on Facebook, you have likes and you press likes and all that. But I want to share with you something that goes a little deeper than that. And it's found in the life of King Saul, who God chose, but he messed up a few times. And we see what was the issues of his heart. And I pray that it will be an app word spoken to you today. So part three of our hashtag follow mess series is found in 1 Samuel 15, uh, um, uh, 13 through 25. Chapter 15, verses 13 to 25. And I just want to let you know, all you newcomers, we get loud during the preaching of God's word. Can I get an amen, right? Sometimes you'll people clap, sometimes they will stand, uh, uh, not to applaud the preacher, but we believe in the word of God. Man, with so much negative news out there, we need the good news of Jesus Christ. And we want to say, yes, Lord, do it again. Just like in the Old Testament, we're in the New Testament, do it again, God. Can't get a loud amen to that? So that's why we like to get excited for the Lord. Today it's 1 Samuel 15, 13 to 25. So we do have a tradition at our church. We like to stand up to honor God's word. So let's all stand up for the reading of God's holy word. We're going to have it up on the screen as well. You read silently long as I read aloud God's holy word. 1 Samuel 15, verses 13 to 25. If you're tracked with me, can I get an amen? Okay? Let me read aloud God's holy word if you silently read along with me. When Samuel, the prophet, reached him, that is Saul, Saul said, the Lord bless you. Can you point to someone and say, Lord bless you, okay? I have carried out the Lord's instructions, but, everybody shout, but. But Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Malachites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough. Everybody say enough. No. Can you just point at someone next to say enough, all right? No. I hope you spouses didn't do that uh, to each other, all right? Enough. Everybody shout enough, okay? No. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me. And if you really look at it, he didn't say tell me. Saul's like, look, tell me. Tell me, Saul replied. And Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But, everybody shout but, okay? There's God's but and there's human but. Saul's but, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Malachites and brought back Agag, their king. He's saying, he's lying through here. He's saying, I completely destroyed everything. Then he says, I didn't kill their king. And then he says in verse 21, the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. God said, wipe them all out, but they didn't. They took the plunder, and he's been found out. So Saul's saying, oh, we're going to give it as offering to the Lord. Yeah, you, you know the, the bleeding sheep that you hear and the low cattle? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, you caught us, but we were actually intending it to give it to the Lord. And verse, next verse, but Sam replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey, everybody say Obey. It's better than sacrifice. Everybody say, better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Can you point to someone and say, that's some tough word. That's some tough word. But I want to give you hope to give the context of that. Before you sit down, the sermon title simply today is, Our Need to be Light. Our Need be light. Dash, it's almost like need more likes. Whether it be in social media or even deeper in our own lives. We're longing for that. Everybody take your right hand's fingers. Before you sit down, we'd like to be a participatory church. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
And with gusto, I want you to find three people, make eye contact, and say, I need for more likes. I need for more likes. Say like you mean it. Mean like say, I need for more likes. I need for more likes. All right? Before you say that, can you just point someone and say, why do we need to be liked? Point as a person, why do we need to be liked? Okay, you may be seeing the presence of God. What does the Bible have to say about our need to be liked for, for more likes? Need more likes. And I hope that you're not going to stare at me like all judgmental, like you're better than this. But, you know, and I, I'm being honest before you and the Lord. I don't really get caught up into this, but I do occasionally look at it. Have you ever caught yourself when you posted something on social media? And you posted it. And then Facebook sent you a little thing. This post is actually being responded well. And then you look and you see how many likes you have on it. Now you're like all quiet all of a sudden, like you never do it. And you see it and you're like, oh, I get all these. And I don't really look at it because I realize, you know, it's all fickle right there. But I know some people, you see that your post is reaching a certain threshold. Oh, it's going to reach 50. 50 likes or 100 likes or it's 199. And you see that threshold and you keep looking at it every five minutes. Did I cross that threshold or not? And then when you get it, you're like, yeah. And isn't it so silly? We act as if by the number of likes, it actually adds validation to us. It makes it seem like, oh yeah, this is really, really important. Man, I feel so important now as a result of it. It sounds so silly. What does someone say? It sounds so silly. It sounds so silly. We go by social media and by people's responses, we actually predicate our lives on it. So I really don't even look at that stuff. I'm like, oh. But most of us have a temptation to look at it. And I want to go something a little deeper. Our longing to be liked, to be approved. And think about it. When someone doesn't feel loved and liked, they will compromise things. How many young women sell themselves to have sex in their body for someone who they think loves them because they didn't get loved and liked in their own home? How many of us sacrifice and compromise our morals because we just want people to like us, to be approved, to be popular, to be accepted? Even how we react in our marriage, in our relationships, it's all because of these things of why we want to be liked, we want to be accepted, we want to be respected, and all these things. We have a deep inner longing. And the Bible has to say a lot of things about that. And we come upon a man, Saul, who was tall, good-looking, handsome. He was all buff. He looked the part of a great leader. He was the first king of Israel. But just what you see on the outside doesn't always match with going on on the inside. And I want to share with you just three things here today about what was really eating up Saul, even though on the outside it looked like he had it all together. So I want to share this idea with you about why do we have the need for more lives? And what does the Bible have to say about that? Going deeper to the heart matter. The first thing that I want to share with you is about our heart motives. Everybody say heart motives, okay? Shout even louder, heart motives, okay? Tell me about our heart motives. What do I mean by that? It says here that when Samuel reached uh, Saul, him, Saul, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions, but Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. God said, destroy everything. But Saul didn't do it. And he makes an excuse. He's saying, it's not my fault. Can you point someone next to you? It's not my fault. It's not my fault. God told him to do it, and, he's, and then he got caught. He didn't do it all, and he says, it's not my fault. He says in verse 15, the soldiers brought them to me. I know I was supposed to wipe them all out as king and have the soldiers do it, but the soldiers decide to take the plunder. So the soldiers brought them from the Malachites, and they spared the best. We destroyed everything that was not good. Isn't it easy for us to give away things that are not good, but the best we want to keep to ourselves? And we want to now do it to sacrifice the Lord. And I find it so amazing. He says, not to the Lord our God. He says, sacrifice the Lord your God. Hmm. I thought Saul believed in God. But we totally destroyed the rest. 
And it's something that I want to go a little deeper here because it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel when God had rejected Saul and now was going to anoint David. And David's older brothers comes and Samuel's impressed. Man, Eliab, Shammah, man, these guys look the part of being a great leader. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We often go by what we see in the externals, actions, what we see in the externals, but God's always looking what's going on on the inside. We judge people by their outward actions, but God's seeing on the inside. And I don't know I'm preaching to, but I have good news for you. You may not have come to church with the best brand, but it doesn't matter. God sees your heart. It doesn't matter what car you drove into, even though we live in Irvine, because it doesn't matter. God sees your heart. Did you want God instead of trying to show off what car drive wheels that you have right there? God sees you. You may come and you may feel like, God, I don't, I don't match up. But God's like, no, I just want your heart more than what you can just sing unto me. I want it all. And I accept you just the way you are. So God sees all that. And we see here that we get impressed by people's external. Oh, that person's good looking. That person seems to have it together. That, drive, that person drives a nice car. That person's so articulate and all that. But God's always looking at the heart. And the men of Saul's day, the men of Saul thought that Saul was successful. But in God's eyes, Saul had failed. We got a great victory of the Amalekites. We plundered them, destroyed them all. But God saw that he failed. And it wasn't just the act. God was going after something deeper in his heart about heart model. So I want to share with you some things that I think is really, really pertinent to us because it applies to Paul and I think it applies to us as well. Uh, Kent Lee and also uh, Do Reverend Dr. Min Chung wrote, write, wrote about this. And it comes from uh, what John Calvin, the great theologian John Calvin said this. He, John Calvin says, the heart is the factory of idols. Because what our heart wants, we keep on producing like a factory idols. And Kent Lee and Min Chung talks about these heart motives that we really need to understand and be able to uh, give it to God for God to change it. And these are four heart motives. The first is perfect me. Everybody say perfect me, okay? This is like when your heart and it's the person, the personality type that's like, you know, they have such a high standard. It's all about performance. And so you are a perfectionist. Don't look at the person who's perfectionist, especially your spouses. You're a perfectionist, and so you have a high standard. And so everybody has to meet that standard, but when they exceed it, you feel threatened. Or if someone violates it and doesn't meet your standard, then you're judgmental, self-righteous, right? And so you're perfectionist, like, I got to do this, match this, to look this way. And I got, you have an insecurity, an idol in your heart. It's all about me, so I got to look good, so I got to do this. It's perfect. I got to have things perfect, perfect perfection. And people have to match it, but they can't get above me or else I'll feel insecure. But when they come beneath me, I don't feel, I don't, I feel like I could judge them because I'm trying to be perfect in that way. That's one heart motive. But the second is respect me. Everybody say respect me, Okay. Point to someone else and say, say, respect me, okay? Especially since a lot of Asians, it's all about respect, respect, respect. And what happens, this motive is simply this. It's one where it's really an idolatry of worship. You got to worship me. You got to respect me. I know some of you husbands, woman, you better respect me. And you say, because you're going through pyramidal counseling, the number one need of a man is to feel respected. And the wife says, well, number one need of a woman is to feel cherished. You go back and forth. But most of us, you know, like we want respect. And the person who was a heart motive of respect was like, man, I want you to respect me. I'm doing these things so that you're going to honor me. And I'm going to be the, you got, wherever I come in the room, I need to be respected. I need to be proud of I need to be popular in that way. So you command respect. And it is really an idolatry of worship. All eyes on me and honor me in that way. So when you are not recognized, you get angry. When you get overlooked, you get angry. When you get passed over for that job promotion, why God? You get angry at God, angry at your boss, angry at the person that got blessed. So it's all about like, worship, respect me. I need to feel respected. And then the third is like me. Everybody say like me, okay? These are people who have so an idol in their heart. It's not like respect me, it's an idol of worship. Like me is an idol of your name and reputation. I got to have a brand. 
I got to protect my name. I got to protect my reputation. And so the like means are like, I will do anything for people to like me. I want everybody to like me. You come to a room, you feel insecure, you want everyone to like you. Sometimes you'll go and you'll say all the right things and you want people. It's like a politician who's working the crowd because they want their votes. So you feel insecure. And so you, anytime someone doesn't like you, you feel upset. Like in this room, everybody can like you except one person. And your joy is totally demolished because that one person doesn't like you. Everyone loves you here, but you're like, oh, that one person doesn't like me. And you go, woe is me. So our longing, if we never have enough, we want everyone to like me. And studies show that people who want to be liked and to be popular will compromise things. They will change things up, lower standards, just so that you will like me. Pastors, I'll dilute the word of God just so you'll like me. Oh, we'll, we'll change the standards of God just so that we could be more likable. So these are the heart motives of some people like, Oh, I have this longing. I want to be liked. I want to be liked. I want to be liked. So I'm going to just do whatever I can to have people like me. Just like me. Just like me. Just like me. So when you have to confront people, you won't do it because you just want them to like you. A doctor has bad news, but you, don't, you want your patient to like you, so you're not going to really share really the, the things that need to be said. You would fire that doctor, wouldn't you? But how come pastors, you hold to a different standard. Just We got to be able to say that, hey, we want God to like what is being shared and speaking the truth and love. Can I get an amen to that? So many of us are like, like me, like me, like me. And then the fourth one is love me. Everybody say love me, okay? These are the types of people who are like, they don't care how many people like them or not. They just need a handful that will love them. And all they care about is having their affections met. As long as I have a few people, I don't care. What's your name? I don't get out of my face. You just walk away. I have my circle of friends that love me. But you know what? It's also a hard motive because it's about an idol of love. It's all about you getting the love, self-centered love. And so when the person that's in your circle doesn't love you, you get angry. Hey, you're supposed to love me. What's up with you today? And so you feel threatened in that way. And so I want to share this because when I read about this, it's so true. King Saul had two issues. He was a like me, as we read in the opening verses. Why did you not kill everything? Why did you take this plunder? Oh, the soldiers that I'm leading did it. He wanted to be approved and liked by his soldiers. When God had given him to be king to lead the people to do the right thing fully. So he said, I want them to like me. I don't want them to be upset that they just had a great will. You got to destroy all the plunder to God? No, just, you, let's keep it. Oh, we got caught by Samuel the prophet? Oh, we're going to offer it to God anyway. Like me. And then we see also his heart motive was to respect me. It says here in verse 12, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument. Everybody say monument. Get this. In his own honor. And has turned and gone on to Gilgal. When Moses experienced victory, he built an altar unto God. When Samuel experienced victory, he built a monument Ebenezer stone unto God. And yet Saul, when God gives him the victory, he builds a monument in his own honor. Point to someone and say, that's selfish. That's pretty selfish, all right? Can I get an amen to that, right? It sounds pretty, I mean, God gave me the victory. Thank you, God. Let me put up a statue of myself. And so he's like, I want the respect. He's so insecure. I need people to respect me. And then it says here, after the whole dialogue, uh, uh, the Samuel prophet rebukes him. And Saul says, I have sinned. Okay, I confess. I messed up. But look at this. He says, please honor me before the elders of my people. And before Israel, before the, all the nation of Israel, come back with me so that I may worship the Lord, your God. He says, my people, but your God. You see it? When you read it in English, you just kind of overlook it. So his heart was more fixed on, I want people to respect me. I want people to, to, to like me. And in this case, he got rebuked publicly by the prophet Samuel. And he's like, okay, okay, I've sinned. But he isn't even really the Okay, you caught me sinning. But please, make me look good in front of my church leaders. Make me look good in front of my people. I'll do anything with it. Just, just, 
And so he, Samuel says, no, I'm not going to do this. And so what Saul says, uh, we didn't read this. He grabs the prophet's uh, hem and it rips. And then God says, because, uh, God uh, gave a word to Samuel and say, because you have d- uh, done this, just like you've torn my robe, the Lord has torn this kingdom away from you. And I want to say this to be wrong, real, because don't we all have issues? Perfect me, respect me, like me, love me. And what's the antidote for that? The antidote is simply this. None of us can be perfect except the fact that God alone is perfect. Can I get an amen to that? And we need to admit that. We can be trying to be in excellence, but if you're trying to be perfect, you're trying to become like God. We have to do our best in excellence, whether in word and deed for the glory of God. Whether you eat, you do for the glory of God. When you brush your teeth, you do for the glory of God. When you clap unto God, you do for the glory of God. But it's only God who's perfect, and you got to surrender that over to God and not expect that of other people. On the other hand as well, respect me. It, don't, don't understand that respect is not, not trying to get people attention to you, but drawing their, them to attention toward God as a result. So we need to understand and surrender that and say, God, if I have an issue, like I need people to respect me all the time, what's really the craving of my heart? I want to let you know that you've honored me, and therefore I'm securing you. And then the like me, that if you're compromising things at work just so that your coworkers will like you or your boss, but God sees it and doesn't like it, what's really driving your heart? And then the love me. And I say this honestly because of this, because so many people have sacrificed and compromised things just for the sake of love. But if you place it in people like Saul was, you will find that it's always still going to never satisfy you. You'll only find it. God created your heart, and God created your heart first and foremost for God himself. He will perfect you with his righteousness. He will honor you. Even when you're wretched and and a dirty sinner, he will still honor you like the adulterous woman caught in adultery. And he not only will love you with unconditional love, he will never stop loving you, but he will like you too. Isn't that good? Can I get an amen to that, right? Because sometimes in Christianity, oh, I have to love that person. But I don't like that person in my heart. But God not only loves us, but he likes his children. Can I get an amen to that? So I want to ask you, what area does that fill into you? So point someone say, which part are you? Which part are you? Which part are you? Second point I want to share with you about is simply this. Not only our heart motives, but our heart fears. Everybody say fears, okay? Everybody say, and insecurities, okay? Our heart fears and insecurities. What I want to address is the fear of man versus the fear of the Lord. Verse 24 says this, then Saul said to Samuel, you got me, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's commands and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Can I get an amen to that, right? And as I even mentioned last week, when you are close and intimate, you honor God and you fear God, you will not have to fear any man as a result. Because you know and trust that is God is in control. The Bible says, do not fear people who may hurt your bones and all that, but fear the Lord who created your soul. So I want to challenge you. What's going to be the, the difference between Christians today and the secular world? What's going, to, uh, the, what's going to be the key factor? They go to concerts. They have nice songs. They go to great self-help, like positive thinking people, you know? Those people that go up and they do jumping jacks and and push-ups and get you all motivated and you're like, oh yeah! And then five days later, oh no. What's the difference? You know what the difference is? We need more men and women of courage to stand up for God when everybody's bowing down. I want to ask you, youth, God will take you and raise you if you will not fear man, but fear the Lord. Don't be afraid to show that you're a Christian. Don't go like this when you're praying for your meal. Oh, I got something in my eye. I dropped my napkin. Put your hands together and say, Lord, I thank you for this food that I'm about to eat. Even though everybody's staring at me, I don't care because you are looking down on me with heaven and you're pleased with your son or your daughter right now. At work, I know we can't mention Christ and all that, but I want you to, wherever you go, you go to that work, keep it go, Lord, I invite your Holy Spirit to come into this room right now. And I will show my Bible on my cubicle desk. Even others are like, oh, Christian. And you say, oh, yes, I am. And you may be thankful because I'm praying God's blessing upon you. 
And inside you don't have to say, but you got your job because I'm, you're still keeping your job even though you're lousy at it because I'm praying for God to bless you anyway. You don't have to say it out loud, but you know what you're just saying right there. Having the fear of the Lord that even in church, we have no fear of man. Oh, what if we do this? People make it offended. No, I don't want to offend God. I don't want God's presence to leave our church. What good is it? It's then it's like a self-help motivational speaking then. I want God to speak to his people and love them through God's word. Can I get an amen to that? So we can't compromise that. To compromise means to compromise the promises and the truth of God, to dilute it in that way. And when it's diluted, the medicine loses potency. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we have fears, and some of us make decisions not fearing God but fearing man. I want to ask you, the remedy for that is to have faith and fear God more than man. And even though you will go through setbacks, you may get passed over by the promotion, but I want to let you know, give it time, God will come through for you. Another area of insecurity is this, the fear of the Lord, but the other is humility through ins from insecurity. Also, versus humility versus security in Christ. You know, we all have our insecurities, don't we? I, I, those of you who know me at our church, you know, I, I used to have this um, insecurity issue of being short. I'm just being honest with you, you know what I mean? And uh, you know why? Uh, my parents, and they meant it well, but they're like, oh, you got to drink milk, you got to drink milk, you got to drink milk. And I didn't drink that much. That's, that's, that, then they say, that's why you're so short. That's why you're so short. And I'm like, okay, I'm short, I'm short, I'm short. And you know what? I stand up next to you, most of you men. I'm not that short compared to you guys. Either that or you're short as well. I don't know, right? But we all have our insecurities. Some of you, you don't like the way you look. Some of you are insecure because of what school you came out of. Or your job or job title, what you drive, where you live, what brand, purse you have or don't have. We're insecure, and so we try to cover all those things up. But you know what? It's a very subtle thing. Sometimes we act humble because we're so insecure. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm so lowly. Everybody's better than me. Everybody's taller than me. Everybody's better looking than me. Everybody's smarter than me. Everybody's got a better job than me. Everybody's got a better home than me, better car than me. All these things. And therefore, we act humble. But that's humility based upon the flesh. But true biblical humility comes from your security in Christ Jesus. Yes, it is true. You can't do all things. But through Christ and in Christ, you can do all things. What is impossible for man is possible with God. And I, I want to say this because... You see people, celebrities who have a lot of likes and followers, and they're committing suicide. Korea and Japan, Asia, a lot of suicides. Even the United States, a lot of suicides going on. And all boils down to their lack of identity. They're insecure. They may act all humble and nice, but they're insecure from their insecurity. But I want to let you know that when you are in Christ Jesus, no matter what the world labels upon you, that label won't stick. Because heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. Can I get an amen to that? And I want to challenge you. You can have faith in the Lord and trust in God that if you're in Christ, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's why I want to challenge all of us to find our security. And therefore, since we're secure, when we're secure, then we can be humble. When we're insecure, we, it's a false humility. Oh, you're better than me. But in the end, we're coveting them. I want what you have. But biblical security means I am who God says I am, as that song goes. Not what the word. I am who you say I am. I feel like a sinner, but my feelings don't dictate the truth. You say that I'm a saint of God. I am what you say I am. God, I lie. I feel like I messed up. But God, you said you pay for that mess. I am what you say I am. God, the world says you don't measure up. But God, you say that I do measure up. And I'm worth dying for on the cross. I am who you say I am. I'm secure in Christ. I may be short, but I'm tall in God's eyes. You may not be good looking, but you're beautiful in God's eyes. You may not have a nice handbag, but God has given you, and you're secure in Jesus Christ. And when we're secure, then we don't have to feel insecure. We can lift other people up in freedom. Amen. We don't have to be like, oh, that person got the blessing. That person got the attention. No, we could be free. He with the sense that it's free is free indeed. Can I get an amen to that? So I want to challenge you. Our insecurity is to surrender it over to God. And how, what's the remedy for that? What's the remedy? I'm so glad you asked because I'm going to answer that even though you're not saying it out loud. One a biblical scholar said this, because many of us are plagued with, what is God's will for my life? 
What does God want me to do? And those are all great questions. Please don't misunderstand me. But this author says this. The will of God is revealed by two things. The promises of God and the commands of God. All in the Bible. It breaks down to the promises of God and the commands of God. And we put faith in the promise. See, it's the promises and the commands, they're two sides of the same coin. You can't separate. That's the will of God for our lives. Most of us say, have faith. Faith. So we put faith in the promises. But that's only one half of it. The other half of it is the command. So how do I fulfill God's will and see it happen? It's by obedience to the command. You get it? You can't just say, I have faith in the promise of God. I claim it, I claim it, I claim it. Why isn't it happening? It may be timing, but even if you're waiting, it's not happening. It's because you're putting faith. And then the opposite side of God's will and God's word, the promises and the commands, you have to obey the commands. Then you come together. That's when the will of God happens. Most of us, I claim it, I have faith in Jesus, but you're not obeying. That's what's all. He didn't obey God fully. So I want to say, Maybe it might be a timing thing. If you're having faith and you're believe, having faith in the promise of God and you're obeying God's commands and it's still not happening, I want to let you know God is never late. He will come through. Amen. But for some of us, maybe it's not coming through because you're saying, God, I, the message is about promises. I put faith in that, God, yes. And God's like, what about the other part of my will, the commands? Are you obeying that? If you're not willing to, you're not completing that in that way. And that's why we can feel secure. I want to let you know this. If you're putting faith in God's promise or obeying God's commands, God's not asking for perfection, but a heart after God's heart. Saul's heart wasn't after God. That's why he said, you're God, Samuel. Let's go worship your God. But he says, my people. He idolized and wanted the people's approval more than God's. And so in the same way for all of us, I want to let you know that God is such a good God. And he's saying, if you're obeying the commands of God and believing, having faith in the, in the promises of God, in his right time, God will come through. You may go through storms. You may go through a hurricane. You may go through rainy seasons. You may go through drought. You may go through difficulties. But I want to let you know what Isaiah 43 says. Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. When you walk through the waters, you will not be swept over. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The fire will not consume you because I am the Lord your God and I have summoned you by name. Can I get an amen to that? So if you trust and obey God's commands and have faith in the promises, in his time, God will come through. That's what it means to put the Lord first in your life. That when you trust God, that God will come through. And many of us, we just start to say, God, I get discouraged. I'm being faithful to you. But I, I have never seen, as even David writes, I have never seen the righteous be lacking from the hand of God. God will always come through for you. Can I get an amen to that? So point to someone and say, cast all your fears and secu- insecurities to God. Cast all your fears and insecurities to God. If you agree with me, can I get a loud amen today right now? Huh? The third thing I want to share with you. Is about our heart delight. Everybody say delight. delight. Our heart delight over our heart desires. Everybody say heart desire. heart desire. What's the difference you're thinking? Heart delight over our heart desire. And what I want to address about is the approval of man versus the approval of God. This is what Saul was dealing with. He says here, why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Samuel saying, but this is Saul saying, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Malachites and brought back Agag, their king. Their soldiers took sheep and cattle. Again, he's saying, the soldiers. He's not taking ownership. I allowed them to do it as king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. You know what it's, it's like this? It's like someone who gets caught cheating on their taxes. And their response is, oh, I was cheating on my taxes because... I wanted to give more offering to the church. Or I'm having an adulterous affair because I want to become a better lover to my spouse. That's what Saul's doing, essentially. God, supposed to obey God fully. Oh, well, you know, uh, I wanted to please the people, my man, instead of pleasing God. So you know what? I 
instead of devoting everything to God, I'm going to just allow them. But we're going to use it now for a good means. We're going to sacrifice it to God. And I want to go to something deeper because our need for approval really goes to a deeper heart issue. And that heart issue is simply that we want something so deep to feel so united, so valued, so popular in our hearts that we'll do everything, sell ourselves to be able to get that. But the Bible has a remedy for that. It says in Psalm 37, if we could put it up on the screen. Psalm 37, verses. Let's read it aloud together. I know for some of you it's your favorite verse. It's one of my favorite verses as well. Let's read it aloud together. Delight yourself in the Lord. Wait, hold on before you go. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So it says, delight yourself in what? The Lord. Not in anything. Not in any possessions. Not in your money. Not in your human relationships. Because they will fail you one day. I'm sure if you've been married long enough, your spouse didn't come to you for you one day or another. Oh, I asked you to do dishes. Oh, I'm sorry, honey, I forgot. And so delight yourself in the Lord, not in your boss, not in your company that hired you and gave you that huge signing bonus because that company might let you go like three years later from now during a downturn in the economy. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will what? Let's read it again. He will give you the what? The desires of your heart. Many people are conflicted. So what does that mean, pastor? I tell God I delight, so God gives me what I desire. But let me say this, as I was studying this, if you do that, the answer to that is yes and no. So do I delight myself in the Lord to get God to fulfill and give me the desires of my heart? Yes and no. But let me go a little deeper than that. The idea of that is simply this, delight yourself in the Lord. Do we use delighting, putting God first as a means to an end? I like you, I love you, God. I delight myself to an end to get the desires of our heart. But first, you got to graduate on the other thing. You don't delight in God as a means to an end of what you want. You delight in Jesus and God as the means because he is the end. Are you tracking with me? Can I get an amen to that? Some of you are like, oh, what are you talking about? You delight yourself in God as the means, as the access point to get the desires of your heart. And the desires of your heart is first and foremost and only Jesus himself. You want God so much more than any other thing. That's why, have you noticed? When you move into a bigger home, you're satisfied, but then you still feel like it's not enough. When you get a new car, it satisfies, and then it's never enough. When you get that job, you think it satisfies, but it's never. Because created material things was never intended and created by God for us to delight in. Only thing that truly gives us the contentment and fulfillment is God and God alone. Can I get an amen to that? So if you place and delight yourself in getting that job and getting married and living in that community and having that salary range, or going on many vacations, or having children. Uh, those are all good things. But I want to let you know, God created us first to have a relationship with him first than anyone else. So we're supposed to delight ourselves in God, and so that God is so, so good, nothing else even comes close to it. Our desire is God and God and God alone. And Saul didn't want that. He rather had the approval of man. He wanted to be honored and respected. And he was even willing to sacrifice just so that the people would look at him. And he didn't care about how God was looking at him right there. So I want to ask you this, you know, because we live in Orange County. People, and, and don't get me wrong, if God, has, if God has blessed you, be thankful. Can I get an amen, right? Be a good steward of it. But don't let the blessings become the idol in your life. Don't replace the blessings. Don't replace the blesser with the blessings, let me just say. Don't replace... The giver with the gifts. Make sure that you're delighting yourself. And that's why for all of us, it's a good litmus test. If you're finding lack of joy or something, it's usually because we're not delighting ourselves in God anymore. We're delighting in something that we want. But when we delight in the Lord, whether we get that or not, God may give it to us or not, we'll still find a full fulfillment in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, I want to just say this because what's going to make us stand out? Yes, if God has blessed you, live in those wonderful homes. Um, God has blessed my family, too. We, we live in a, a, a God has 
bless us with the home we're living out here as well. And you know what? But I want to say that you put things into perspective. God gave you a nice car. Thank God for that. But take, keep, take people to church in that car. Has God given you a nice handbag? Don't, do, don't just carry it around like, let's see what handbag I got. Just be thankful for it. And when God bless you with another handbag, sell that one to give to the poor. Make some money, give to the poor. You're like, oh, that's so hard, Pastor. Because you wanted to sell it. You got a new one because that old one doesn't satisfy you anymore, does it? It's never enough. As I close, I want to say this. You know, uh, how many of you saw the movie The Greatest Showman? Raise your hand if you saw The Greatest Showman. All right. How many of you liked the movie Greatest Showman? It's one of my favorite movies. And um, I, uh, I, and my, even my, my son liked the movie. Oh, praise God for that, right? And, and we got the Blu-ray and all that. And my daughter loves it because, uh, you know, she's really a motor mouse and she talks so much. And I say, Carrie, you want to watch Greatest Showman? Huh? And then we let her watch it because she just enjoys singing. And my wife and I love because she has perfect pitch, unlike me. Thank God for that, right? She can sing like she loves that song. But I remember the scene, you know, if, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. I don't, I'm not giving away the whole plot, so don't get mad at me. Don't kill the uh, messenger here. But what happens is, you know, um, Hugh Jackman's character, P.T. Barnum, when a ch young child, he, uh, as a young child, he meets this really aristocratic um, young girl from rich background. Uh, her name is Charity like each other and they grow up and he grows in a poor background his father is like a tailor but his father dies he's really poor whereas charity lives in a huge mansion and all that has all the amenities but they love each other he's writing to her when she goes to boarding school and all these things and then when he gets finally grown up he comes and takes uh, to take uh, charity to go with him and charity's father's like he's going to come back because the life that you're going to offer is not going to be good enough he's going to come back and they go off and they go to the city. And they're just so in love. They're just holding hands, walking to the city, and they're enjoying it. And then they go to the apartment. They don't have much money. It's a small flat. And they go on the rooftop and all that. And it's a beautiful romantic scene. I don't want to give away the whole movie, but they're like singing and they're dancing. And then Hugh Jackman's like, man, this is so little. And Charity, his wife, they've been married now. She says something to the effect of, this is more than you know, when you're so in love with the person that you want to be with, you could be in the poorest place, but you'll be rich. Or you could be in the richest place, and yet feel so poor. And when I saw that, I was thinking, wow, God has blessed us. If you're blessed, can I get an amen, right? All of us are blessed. Most of us are living 96% better than the rest of the world. If you got five bucks in your pocket, you're richer than 96% of the people, most kids your age as well. So we are blessed. Can I get an amen to that, right? And yet, I want to challenge you with the fact of delighting in God. What's going to set the difference? I pray that we will gather people who are so serious. They don't want to come to just a nice church. They want to encounter Jesus and experience his love. I pray that when they're worshiping and they're saying, God, with my hands in the heavens... Lord, I come alive. As I praise you, may the presence of God be so strong. May my marriage come alive. May these dead bones come alive. Because my delight is not in a job. It's not in a It's in you, Jesus. The world has been looking at the church and what Christians have been saying and found it lacking as Ura McManus once wrote. Saw no difference between the church and the secular world. I challenge you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's be God chasers of our generation. Youth chasing after God. Singles chasing after God. Married folks chasing after God. Divorced folks chasing after Because we're all seeking after God. We want the real deal in Jesus Christ. And we're not afraid of man. I'm trying to silence us. Tell us to be quiet. We want to go after God. And so I want to ask you the root of all the things I want to be liked. I want to be approved and all that deals with the fact that you haven't fully surrendered that area of your heart to God. Only God can give shalom wholeness. So when we do so, I know and believe that God is going to do something, make you so complete. You could go into your classroom tomorrow, and even though everybody's a hater, you say, I'm a lover because Jesus loves me. You can go to your uh, workplace where people like to gossip, and they may be gossiping, slandering you, but you say, 
It doesn't matter what you say because God's words will remain in my life forevermore. You can go to any place, even when someone cuts you off after church and you've heard the sermon today and someone cuts you off and they're mad at you and they give you the number one finger sign right there to you. You say, I bless you in Jesus' name. And I don't mean in a negative way like I hope God will strike you dead one day and you get into a car accident the next block. Not that way, but rather, God, I pray you'll bless them because that person's got some issues, but I'm secure in Jesus Christ. I want to challenge all of us. Can we find our love every Sunday and find our completeness in Jesus Christ? Not based upon a praise scene with a song set, not based upon a preacher, but because Jesus is alive and well in this house, in my father's house. His sons and daughters, broken, hurting, insecure, fearful can come. And perfect love casts out all fear. Can I get an amen? Our insecurities are secure and his amazing grace. Can I get a hallelujah to that? And we will not fear what the devil may bring because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I want to challenge you. Don't be like Saul. Be like David. Man, after God's own I delight in you. And can I say this? If there's something that you're holding back from God, that desire is really your delight. Make God your soul delight in your heart and your life. If you've received that today, can I get an amen? Can you all stand with me? Let's all stand.